Pitas are Brian Šošić and Ljubomir Berberović. Uh, they are from, uh, from our academy. Three of point with the topic concept of environment in understanding and treating severe mental illness inside from biology and system approaches. First of all, I must say I'm, I'm not from the academy itself. I'm a member of the uh, board uh, for psychiatric and neurological research, uh, which is one of the sectors of the uh, Department of Medical Sciences. Uh, it, and it's a working body of the academy, which is devoted, in this case, to issues re in relation to mental health and in this case. Uh, what might be interesting to note is that it is actually, and perhaps I can say sadly, the only uh, institutionalized body that deals with the issues related to mental health on the level of Bosnia and Herzegovina as a state. And also, in addition to that, uh, I have to say that I'm very proud to be here also as well as uh, a member of the expert team of Association for uh, Mutual Assistance in Mental Distress, Phoenix, which is organizing this uh, symposium. So my involvement with Phoenix has been taking for well, over a decade now. Uh, Phoenix exists for, for nearly two decades, uh, but it has really shaped my career and my uh, professional experience in many regards. And I must also say that it has helped me um, shape myself personally as well, to, to a large degree. I was very fortunate uh, to be able to be accepted in uh, such uh, a context, in such a, a marvelous and lovely, th this is the adjective that I would like, like to use, a, a lovely bunch of people that uh, share uh, some of the challenges they have. So, <clears throat> on the other hand, uh, my, my academic interests are uh, completely different. So, uh, academically I've been researching and not only uh, teaching but also studying biological psychology or, or psychobiology. So, um, from that point of view I must say I was very lucky that at the university where I worked, where I taught uh, biological psychology, um, I was fortunate to have mixed groups of students. Those with a background in psychology, those who were in psychology major, and also those who were in biology major. So I was often facing a challenge that they came to this course, to these classes, with considerably uh, different uh, knowledge that they had beforehand, so I often had to compensate for certain things. And also, of course, uh, the more I learned uh, about the field of uh, psychobiology, this hybrid between biology and psychology, uh, I, I understood how, how my uh, orientation and my primary education as a psychologist was in certain regards uh, insufficient to understand certain issues. So I will always strive to compensate these gaps in knowledge, not only for my, my students, but also, of course, for myself. And 
in that endeavor, I must say I was extremely fortunate uh, to have been a collaborator for two decades now with Professor Jugomir Berberovich, uh, who jointly with me authored uh, this presentation. But unfortunately, he got a call, so he was not uh, able to, to join us here um, today. Uh, Professor Beberovich is, a, is an, an evolutionary biologist, a geneticist. So uh, um, that was very significant for me to uh, be able to bounce some of the ideas and conceptions that I had um, as a psychologist about certain issues. And some of them were related, of course, to not only how we function as um, psychobiological entities and how uh, the societal um, processes reflect in ourselves, but also what kind of um, input and what kind of uh, context is provided by, by the biology of our development and um, our interaction with the world around us. So our functioning as, as biological organisms was, was the center of, uh, of this preoccupation of mine. So, of course, uh, if we speak of the science of environment, the, the first and foremost of these is, of course, ecology. It has become um, one of the most prominent, most lively scientific disciplines today, but uh, primarily and traditionally it has been treated as a biological discipline, and this is no accident. Of course, now we have to involve lot of this, di these different aspects of understanding of our uh, geography of, uh, or to reduce uh, our understanding of the factors that uh, influence uh, living organisms from the level of, of chemistry, of course, and, and so on. But primarily, this has been a biological discipline. So in a way, this has provided biology, and not only that, an upper hand in this process of gaining uh, a more comprehensive understanding of what an environmental influence really means. What is the environment in which we move, in which we live, and from which we receive influences, and to which we give our inputs as well. So, um, over time, with regard to mental illnesses uh, also, um, scientists have developed some specific uh, interests and specific questions regarding uh, issues such as uh, various toxic agents. So this is why, why I put the uh, mad hatter here. <laughs> Of course, we, we know that uh, the idea that uh, hatters traditionally were prone to, to go mad was because they dealt with mercury. So they had to deal with mercury in the process of, of making these hats. So inhaling that and uh, ingesting uh, mercury made them uh, function in, in ways that seemed quite awkward to, to their uh, community. Or, of course, nowadays we, we have uh, the idea about the importance of various agents that disrupt our, uh, the functioning of, of our endocrine system. Or, for instance, the field that I myself have been working in, and that is prenatal stress. How influences which are predominantly environmental, or uh, it, it, at least mediated by the biology of the mother, of uh, a woman who is pregnant, can
can be carried on to an unborn child and how possibly these effects mediated perhaps solely through biological mechanisms can get reflected in um, the, for instance, increased probability of uh, the appearance of schizophrenia, for instance, in children that were exposed to war as, as they were yet unborn. Also, when we think of um, the idea of uh, what, what our environments mean to us, of course, every biologist would try to give you some kind of an account of uh, our dealing with the, the environment. So, no, no, when I say our, then I'm speaking of us as biological organisms. So, that's, it, it's not only humans. Any, any population of any living creatures, of course, deals with some kind of environment. And the ways how that is done is in some way shaped by evolutionary processes. So anyone who's acquainted uh, with, with these ideas and how they are reflected in the study of, first of all, animal behavior, uh, is probably acquainted with the work of one of the pioneer ethologists, students of animal behavior, Conrad Lawrence, who wrote a book called Behind the Mirror, in which he took these um, verses by Goethe uh, as, as a kind of a motto of, of his book, uh, saying that if the eye were not sunlight, it could never see the sun. Meaning that the way we perceive our environment is, hum is somehow pre-programmed through some evolutionary process. So this is called, uh, this is one aspect of what is known as an evolutionary theory of knowledge. And Conrad Lawrence is one, one of the most important figures in this field. But even before him, um, there, there was another uh, scientist, another biologist that dealt uh, with issues of this kind. When I was a student uh, in, of, of psychology, and uh, in my first year, the, the textbook of cognitive psychology that I had was written by um, a Slovenian cognitive psychologist, Vít Pečák, who, who was himself a student of uh, the great psychologist Charles Osgood. Uh, Professor Pečák and I subsequently became uh, good friends. We, he sadly passed away a couple of years ago. But I never forgot how um, struck I was by, by a sentence that had never before occurred to me that I found on the very first page of the, the textbook he wrote. And that is that there is a difference, there's a, a clear difference between something that we may term environment as being something completely objective, objectively there around us, uh, if we speak of uh, external environment at least, but also that we as organisms are pretty predisposed, pre-programmed to perceive only those aspects of that environment which are relevant to us. So when we speak of different species of animals, that may seem quite obvious if we, if we take um, uh, examples such as dolphins or snakes or bats. We of course know that their uh, perception is focused on completely different aspects of their environment, which to us is completely unknown. So we, we cannot uh, start to comprehend what it is, for instance, to be a snake, to be able to see infrared, 
So, of course, we need to have machines that mimic this for us, that would try to bring this idea closer to us. But this idea was first promoted by uh, the great biologist Jakob von Ixkill, who, who gave this idea under the name of Umwelt. So, uh, it, it's been at some place defined as a sort of an environment world those aspects of the environment which are relevant, only things that interest the animal uh, itself. And one of the um, examples that, that is used to explain that, uh, maybe favorite amongst those who, who follow the lineage of Conic Skill, is the common tick. And I've also used the phrase sensory exotica. This is, uh, uh, I'm using this as a sort of a, a recommendation because there's a very interesting book uh, under that title. Um, and the name of the author is also not, not that <coughs> difficult to, to remember. It's Howard Hughes. Uh, so the, the man named Howard Hughes wrote the book Sensory Exotica that deals with explanations of how different <coughs> species perceive the world around them. But what is uh, very interesting about Jakob von Ixkill is that he tried very often in his writings to uh, focus on um, closing the loops of things that he was addressing. He wanted to look at the physiology <coughs> of um, the organisms under study by showing how these <coughs> different uh, aspects come together. So he often made these loops, uh, and for that reason is, is now, nowadays uh, considered to be, we could say, an early biocybernetist. When, when we speak of the concept of environment, <coughs> I must say, when, when I was thinking about um, what formulates the ideas of biologists most when, when it comes to how <coughs> we interact with the environment, then it is the genetic idea promoted especially by geneticist Theodosius Dudzhansky uh, called the norm of reaction. It's a relatively abstract term, but uh, I've, I've used this um, illustration from from a book of his that was published in 1955 which demonstrates as he says a remarkable plasticity of the phenotype <coughs> in the water crawfoot so he says the normal reaction of this plant is such that the leaves submerged in water develop to look very different from the leaves which are above the water level so this is even an example of an intra-individual variation, how even simultaneously you can see an organism reacting differ differently and differentially to different environments. But uh, Dobzhansky was a first-class theoretician, and uh, he was careful not to fall into a trap of trying to postulate any kind of more concrete models of how this might be applied to, to various <coughs> organisms. But of course, these ideas are very relevant when we look at the distinction between what is hereditary and what is not hereditary. So uh, one example that Dobzhansky used in, in his writing that I often tell my students is about the idea of how we tend to think, for instance, of, he used the example of scurvy, uh, as an illness which is, of course, we would all agree easily, which is environmentally induced. So you don't get enough vitamin C and you get scurvy, right? 
So it has to do with your environment, obviously. But what Dobzhansky pointed out, but that means basically it's genetic. It, it only has to do with the variation in environment. But basically all humans are prone to get scurvy given the condition that they are uh, in an environment in which they cannot get enough of it, enough of uh, vitamin C. Now, <coughs> this idea was adapted to, to some uh, degree by Irving Gottesman, who put forward the concept of uh, the range of reaction. It, it is elegant, it is quite neat, uh, it is quite instructive in some ways, uh, but it is also criticized by many as uh, being also, at the same time, maybe overly crude. What Dobzhansky pointed out, we could never possibly uh, attempt to cover the variation of environments in which an organism find itself, because it's basically, it's uh, infinite, that, that variety. But what Gottesman, and essentially, to a degree, this, this is uh, n not that wrong uh, idea, that there is kind of a difference between uh, the range of environments to which uh, different genotypes can react differentially uh, depending on the conditions that are present in that environment. So in the same kind of environment, one organism may flourish and the other organism with the genotype that does not allow uh, that kind of uh, range of, of reaction to differences uh, will not exhibit any more significant uh, differences than it normally would if it had been reared, for instance, in an impoverished environment. So I'm looking forward to uh, hearing uh, a lecture by Professor McCormick later on who will focus on the idea of uh, enriched environment. Now, when it comes to psychology, uh, we've mostly been focused on uh, pathologies. And we speak, when we speak of uh, what the environment does, and of course, uh, considering that this is a symposium uh, focused on, on psychiatric illnesses, uh, th this idea has to be, uh, I presume, close to all of us, and that is the concept of uh, diathesis, uh, or proneness to, to develop uh, certain symptoms in relation to the presence of, of some stressors. Uh, according to, to these authors, we, we can speak of, of different models being uh, either the case in which uh, for instance, here, the, the diathesis is uh, so different amongst different people that it may happen that some people will develop certain kind of pathology. This particular article dealt with de depression, but this applies basically to all psychopathology, to all of normal psychology. Uh, would develop some kind of symptoms regardless of how low the amount of stress it is that the person is exposed to. While the other, regardless of how high that level of stress is, will never uh, manifest any kind of uh, psychopathology. And, and so on. The, so the, these models are, are uh, different and uh, maybe uh, the most intuitively acceptable to most people is that, that there is also some kind of uh, continuum there. That 
somehow the diathesis and the amount of stress can correlate in the way they produce uh, symptoms of, of, of psychopathology. And now there's also some kind of uh, idea in, in psychology and in psychiatry that is quite uh, paradoxic in, in its nature. And this idea is so well known that it's only been recently formulated as part of formal science. But when we look at different cultures, when we look even at different religions, it's there. It's the idea that some forms of extreme suffering can lead to exactly the opposite. Not only that the person stays within the boundaries of uh, one's own resilience, but even opposed to that extreme stressor to which one is exposed to, uh, flourishes and grows even beyond the initial uh, state. So, <clears throat> here is a quote of a man, uh, then at, in his 20s. This photograph, of course, is uh, when he was considerably older. But he was in his 20s when he came back to then the second year of medical school in France. So after uh, having had a strong aspiration to become a surgeon later in life, his, his arm was wounded. One, one of the injuries that he sustained at the Second World War was that his uh, left arm was wounded. So uh, due to that, he was forever uh, disabled from pursuing the career of a surgeon. And this is what he says, what the four years of this bitter environment of exposure to war had done to him. He says everything was foggy, everything was blurred. There were colors, iridescent flashes, but no shapes. I no longer knew how to use a microscope. So he's describing what, what it is that he sees. So some skill that he had had before he had gone to war was lost after uh, these years of uh, participating in battle. Instead of adjusting the eyepiece to my sight, I squinted as if taking a four, four years of war to end up here, get my neck broken to be back again in histology exam like a kid and not remember a thing about the sun. This man is Francois Jacob, one of the author, uh, together with Monsieur Monod, of the so-called Operon model, or the Jacob Monod uh, hypothesis. So this, uh, this hypothesis, or this discovery that they made in, in this particular case, which earned the, the Nobel Prize, was uh, about what happens in cells when they are supposed to produce beta galactosidase, and that it happens only when lactose is present. So, of course, this is uh, trivialized to, to the maximum, but basically, um, this is perhaps, I would dare say, one of the last revolutionary discoveries in uh, genetics. Much of what we had since dealt with accumulation of data. We've been learning things, of course, but this was on <coughs> so deep, on a so fundamental level, that it had shown us uh, very clearly that genes are not blind to their own environment. Environment affects the action of genes. They turn on and off in relation to what uh, environment is to, to the genes themselves. 
cells or, or to the cells in which, in which they operate. So the tragedy of Francois Jacob that he was not able to pursue his career as a surgeon meant for the rest of us in humanity that he had to switch to molecular biology and to make uh, this uh, discovery together with uh, Giacomo. So, of course, as I said, this idea of post-traumatic growth is by no means a novelty, uh, not in science, not in culture. In the Far East, the symbol of beauty arising beyond and above uh, the challenges of seemingly very unfavorable environment uh, in Eastern traditions is the flower of the lotus. And this is why I also chose to uh, put up here a logo of uh, the organization Lotus from Tuzla that deals with uh, disabilities, with the rights of people with disabilities. And of course, we, we know the same Peraspera about it. Of course, nowadays, we also have epigenetics. Uh, today, quite a novelty also in uh, psychiatric studies. So we have uh, studies that seem to show us that um, our environment makes a difference, a lot of a difference, uh, when it comes to our functioning. What is a bit controversial, what we are not clear, is how long sustained can these differences be. Uh, if they are sometimes reversible, that it so turns out that we, we didn't think so, at first, that the, the process of methylation, which is at the core of the ideas of epigenetics, uh, sticks on so that uh, changes that are made in one generation, environmental change, can be uh, transferred genetically across generations. But this is, of course, a, a novel field of study and has uh, much, much to promise. In psychology, one of the rare attempts to conceptualize environment from, from the uh, uh, viewpoint of development was by Francis Dagan Horowitz, who spoke of the notion of facilitativeness. I will not uh, linger much on, on, on the concept, but uh, she basically focused on the conditions of, um, of the child, the given state of the child as being a kind of this surface of the curve, which is a product of uh, joint action of uh, environment and organism. So these two interact, and with regard to whether the environment is uh, as she says, facilitative or non-facilitative, uh, and depending on whether the organism is unimpaired, impaired, or vulnerable to, to some kind of uh, 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 de development of, of certain symptoms or, or developmental challenges, then the outcome will be somewhere on this uh, surface. In psychology also, we cannot speak of environmental influences without mentioning Uri Brontenbrenner and uh, his concept uh, of individual as, as part of uh, layers of uh, larger systems. But I, what I wanted to point out was that one of the key influences on, on his work was by Kurt Levin. So Kurt Lewin was one of the people who was part of the uh, pioneers that developed what nowadays is known as cybernetics. Uh, finally, what we have in psychology, those who influence the most our ideas of how we have to 
accept the idea that different environments, different situations, shape our behavior beyond what is usually believed as uh, a kind of the idea of consistency of personality traits. Uh, and that is the uh, teaching by uh, Michel and Schroeder, the so-called cognitive effective personality or cognitive effective uh, processing system or, or CAPS. So I must say, as, as a young psychologist, I was very keen about the idea of personality consistency. I wanted to believe that once you have certain traits, they, they stick, they stay with you. But unfortunately, uh, the, the years have, have taught me that uh, the environment can sometimes be so harsh or, or may, maybe sometimes so cruel, but in, in any case, <coughs> so challenging that it turns you possibly into something completely different. And this is something that uh, these two men have been trying to, to point out for quite some time now. Of course, uh, these ideas come together uh, under the, the cap of uh, system theory and its sister science, we could say, cybernetics developed by other among others, by mathematician Norbert Wiener, who spoke of the so-called essential unity of the set of problems, which said uh, center about communication and control. Influenced by cybernetics, and much similar to what I've shown you about the work of the early bio-cyberneticist Jakob von Ixkill, is an attempt that is not so popular still in, in psychology, but still it, it, it is there. It is uh, a theory proposed by William T. Powers, who attempts to, we could say, close the loop. They, his, his students now uh, speak of, of his theory as of uh, a kind of closed loop psychology. It speaks of perception and its role in uh, behavior. Not as we usually tend to think, that our perception is here to help us shape our behavior in relation to the environment. He says it also works the other way around. I'm, I'm trivializing it to, uh, to some degree, but he says literally, behavior is here to control perception. So if I move, I'm actually controlling how I see the world. I don't see it the, the same way that, that I did when I was staying here. So we can think of not only perception being there to aid our movement, as is commonly conceived in neurobiology and in psychology, but also things may, may work the other way around. And this uh, is, we could say, uh, brings us to, to the notion um, that was so brilliantly uh, expressed by the son of William Bates, the, the man who gave the name to genetics. His, his son was one of the greatest intellectuals of the 20th century, Gregory Bates. And he was also influenced by cybernetics and, of course, by biology, the, the love of his father, who formulated that the unit of survival, and this is what has to be underlined, because as Dobzhansky famously stated, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And what Bateson says, unit of survival is not the organism itself. It's always organism plus environment. And that unit of evolutionary survival turns out to be identical with the unit of mind. Of course, we may come to a conclusion, something that Professor Berberovich uh, loves to point out quite often, and that 
paraphrasing Hobbes, who said that uh, a man is a wolf to another man, we must never forget that a man to another man is his environment. So, in brief, at the very end, we, we have to acknowledge that biology always had the upper hand in understanding on a conceptual level what environment is, what it means, what its significance is. So these ideas that we nowadays can term interactionism or focusing on the influence of the situation such as uh, the personality psychologist Michel and Schroeder believe, these ideas are grounded by uh, teachings that are present in the exact sciences, in, in biology. And also, I was, I was glad to hear um, through Professor Salzer's uh, speech that there are more and more attempts that we definitely need, and that is not only to focus on what the environment means for us in terms of developing risks such as diathesis uh, or uh, playing in concert with the personal diathesis and that is uh, environment as a, as a resource of stresses of various kinds. We also need novel ideas about how environment can be good for us, how environment conducive 